So today I'm going to be talking about VR in the COVID era. Now, some of this is stuff you know, some of it's actually uh, learnings and hopefully there's a bit of hope in there as well. Um, very briefly to introduce myself again to those who've um, recently joined or who didn't see me earlier. Um, so I previously did work, as I mentioned, for, for Vive, but um, I've been working for Interactive um, for the last month or so. And I'm working on partnerships, business development, uh, setting up a partner program. And yeah, it's really exciting to be part of that. So let's jump straight in. Um, now, I think, I don't know how many of you um, opened up a call somewhere in April or May this year with the comment, oh, strange times. Pretty much every single discussion I had with anyone opened up, we are living in strange times, and we are. Um, it's just absolutely bizarre. Even everyday situations that we go through, we're still kind of learning how to handle them. I was at the dentist at lunchtime and I had to queue outside for my appointment and I was being very thankful it wasn't a rainy day, but we're living in very strange times. But that's quite important because that obviously has had a severe economic impact. Um, now, we've got a very international audience here, um, and it's not the same country to country, but the general trend is the same. Um, on a macro scale, the markets are having a big challenge in that sense. Um, companies are having budget cuts. There's a downward trend. And probably the biggest thing at the moment is there's no real certainty. We're all kind of second guessing. Um, I think we even saw that in, say, the first poll Natalia put on today was, uh, how would you like to do this summit next time? Face to face, online, in person. Um, and I was thinking, mm, we probably need an option. It depends what the rules are then. None of us quite know where things are going. And that's a very tough thing to plan businesses on. Um, so that's kind of what we've seen. In terms of what that's meant for VR, and in particular VR training, some sectors have really been smashed hard with that. Um, probably the most obvious one is aviation. Uh, I don't know how many of you have flown actually in the past um, six months. It's um, an interesting experience is probably the best way to describe it. Um, but also physical environment training where you're putting people into the same physical space together. Um, retail training we talked about a bit earlier in the panel but um, obviously retail has had a lot of challenges just with having to shop shops and how all of a sudden you're behaving there so that's had a big challenge and probably the bottom point on this slide is one of the really big ones we've seen a spending stop from a lot of companies um, so there may have been projects that were started but new projects haven't started and that's not everywhere, but we've seen a lot of that. And it's caused a lot of challenges, I think it's fair to say. Um, and there are some absolutely fundamental basic challenges to, to move on from there. Um, so I've mentioned actually that my background, I, I just kind of did some of the very first VR demos back in the day. And even back then we kind of discussed this mm, hygiene, lots of people in the same headset, they're sharing their kind of facial skin or makeup's coming off or we've all got grease in our eyelashes. We, all of us um, sharing headsets has always been a strange thing. We even knew it in a non-virus time, but now I think it's fair to say putting a little fabric mask on and then sharing a headset with someone is probably not enough. Um, better solutions are needed. And, and there are companies actually addressing this. Um, I know on the UV cleaning side, there's, um, there's companies looking at doing that. So properly UV light, killing, killing bacteria, killing germs. Um, but also on basic procedures, processes and disinfection methods. Um, there are people addressing it, but it's a crucial one. Trust is absolutely pivotal at the moment. So that's kind of the bad news, but I don't want to finish on the bad news because actually in the meantime, interestingly enough, people are still working. Technically, everybody on this call today, we're all still working in some way straight, in some way or form. Um, and training is still necessary, actually. In order to do work properly, training is as necessary now or if not more necessary than ever. 
Um, and But also the same problems that the VR industry had and that we've kind of discussed a bit earlier, they still exist. And we'll come to them in a moment, actually. Um, and when I say people are still working, there are industries, actually, there's some industries who either won't, don't or can't stop. And I've referenced a few of them here, power generation, we all need power. So there's massive industrial facilities, training is crucial there. Manufacturing, um, demand for goods is still a massive ongoing thing. Distribution, um, I'm sure lots of you have become best friends with your local Amazon drivers in, um, in the last few months. It's kind of a constant flow of products to people's doors. Um, so there's some industries that have absolutely blossomed and bloomed and also, obviously, anything kind of healthcare related is one that's not been able to stop. So that's still working as well. Um, but back to the challenges, um, this is kind of important. Um, there's still, these are traditional challenges and these aren't COVID related. Not all companies understand the benefit of VR training. Um, there's kind of a spectrum what we found from companies there's some companies who've really had somebody who pulled it put it by the bootstraps and they've really proved the use case and then they've allowed it to scale and there's some companies who've really moved on quite a long way there and there's some companies who are very early on that so not all fully get the benefit and there's a lot of work to be done there um it's a challenge for all of us but it's also a good opportunity for anyone in the industry as all of those companies who could benefit from it but aren't benefiting from vr training yet um hardware though is also seen still as expensive and technical um we know that we've discussed that already um it is getting better it's getting less technical and it's getting less expensive but nevertheless it's still an investment um, but then probably the bigger challenges actually are not hardware driven, it's actually software driven. Um, so let's call it the content gap. Um, we alluded to this a bit earlier, but producing good quality content is not a quick thing to do. In fact, it's actually traditionally been a pretty slow thing. And I know there's been a bit of debate in the chat and the polls, Unity, Unreal, et cetera. Um, and that's a bit of a red herring. It, using any of the tools to produce something good has always been slow. Um, and individual training pieces cost a lot of money. So one individual piece where you're having to generate assets, you're having to build the whole scenes, the environments, etc. it's cost a lot of money. Um, and then obviously once that's done, once that's produced, it's a real challenge. And I think it was, it was mentioned in the panel actually we did earlier, that how, how do you control that? So distribution versions, access rights, hardware problems, and how do you stop it from just being something that you roll out, but actually then in the remote sites within a business, you've just got a bunch of headsets sat there not being used because of these challenges. So this is actually, and this is the shameless plug actually around what Interactive are focusing on. It's kind of what we, we've taken a step back and looked at things that stop the industry scaling. So in the two tools that we're going to be talking about in some detail tomorrow, so I won't go into them now, I'll just reference them, but the two tools, um, the creator tool is all about getting content produced more efficiently, more quickly, templates, reproducibility. So taking the individual content cost per unit piece down, 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 and at the same time, taking a speed up, up, up. So that's the creator. And then the interactive portal, is addressing that in terms of how can you distribute that securely to remote sites, remote clients with different needs, but probably most importantly for all, security at the forefront. So that's the that's the sort of the interactive position in all of this, how we can solve that, because these are fundamental things in how the industry can grow. So it's like I've said, it's strange times, it's stormy waters at the moment, but actually, in many ways, there was probably never a better time to invest in a solid VR plan and solid VR training. So to get those companies who do that now will come through the pandemic very, very well positioned to rebound, to grow and actually to blossom. Um, it also means that they can train in more efficient ways now, whether that be remotely 
or whether that be just actually engaging their workers, like we mentioned. It's the softer factors that keep employees within companies sometimes. Um, and also, as we mentioned, so the underlying tech is evolving. The first, the first one's an obvious thing. So headsets are becoming more portable and affordable. We saw a new Quest announced last week as an example um, that looks both pretty cost efficient and strong. Um, but the other underlying factors in the background are evolving. Um, it's kind of been a bit of a buzzword for a long time. Oh, 5G this, 5G, it's going to change the world. Um, and it will, but it was never going to be an overnight thing. And that's slowly happening now. Um, so there's rollouts, whether that's actually maybe in a campus specific situation for some companies of large factory sites, but also just a more societal rollout of that. And that's going to enable, for example, bringing the latency down, keeping the connectivity flowing so that you can actually run this whole session perfectly in VR in the short term. In fact, even today, there's tools that allow you to do it. But over 5G, yeah, it's something you can easily do. And also AI, so making the software a bit smarter. It's um, It really is about how it can adapt to users a lot of the time. So it's I guess it's the next evolution in a lot of the training scenarios is rather than just performing a function is based on that is then adapting it to you personally and how it responds to you. So they're going to really help it. Um, for the moment, things we'd look at recommending is if it is if it is times of tight budgets, it's really focus on the easy to prove core areas of training. Um, that varies business to business and so it's impossible to reference any specifics but um a good example i mentioned earlier health and safety training um in an industrial site it's absolutely a no-brainer do that kind of stuff and get people to experience it in a headset you're going to have a far better outcome far lower accident case and actually a far more efficient and better trained workforce um however once doing this that will allow once sort of picking up the, the low hanging fruits, if you like, the no brainer projects, then you can actually plan for the more expansive projects later once you've got stakeholder buy in. And I just mentioned the word stakeholders here. Um, this is actually quite an interesting one because um, it is easy to prove the benefits. But this isn't a finished battle yet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the some of the companies we work with are still reasonably immature in their rollout. Um, there's a lot of believers in there, but there's also a lot of people who are skeptical. So that's not a finished battle. So never step away from proving the financial benefits. Um, the PwC white paper that we were talking about earlier is actually a great thing for those who haven't got it. Maybe we should find a link to it and throw it in the in the chat. It's just really good reading and it's good to put in front of the eyes of decision makers. Um, if you're not rolling out at scale yet, start simple. So similar thing to what I've just mentioned, prove the benefits to stakeholders. But more importantly here, scaling is easier than ever, and it's going to become easier than ever as well, even more so. So yeah, focus on efficient ways to create content. So reusability, so reusing your assets, reusing the scenes, reusing your environments. This is back to the interactive creator tool, actually, I was talking about earlier as a, a great template in order to do that. But don't create completely new everything every time you do it. Work with different agencies every time you do it. If you can actually set up a good methodology to produce content efficiently, do it from day one, because otherwise you're going to kind of have a lot of I guess you call them trial projects that don't um, that don't really bring a good enough ROI, and that's going to hinder then the next um, the next approvals from decision makers in what projects you can work on. So the conclusions: um, strange times. COVID has made twenty twenty the most disruptive year in memory. Um, we're going to look back at this, <laughs> obviously, and I don't need to tell anyone on the call this. We're going to look back at this and talk about it in the future as a strange time. But VR training within there is proven, 
is still being done, is still being rolled out, and there's still some amazing projects ongoing. So it will continue to be relevant, and that's important, despite what's happening in the bigger environment. Investing early, even in what looks like a challenge, cha excuse me, challenging financial landscape is still a good thing to do. Um, it will pay dividends. And this actually comes back to what I'm working on now um, in terms of the partnership side with Interactive. And we, we're looking at partnerships for a, quite a few reasons, but the, the reality is we can't do everything ourselves. And that's the reality for most people working in this industry. And neither should they. Focus on what you're good at focus on what you can do properly. Um, and if it's not your area of expertise, it's somebody else's, find them, partner with them and work with them. So don't do everything yourself. Really find those who best fit your landscape and whether that's people who are experts in content creation, asset creation, you name it. There's always benefits to partnering. And that really comes to the final point that only by working together in this will we come through it stronger. And that's really, um, without wishing to get over philosophical, that's both societal and the R at the moment. But yeah, only by working together will we come through it stronger. So I'm gonna finish this with a bit of a, an open call out there. If anybody is interested in partnering with Interactive around um, using some of our tools, the creator and the portal, please get in touch with me. That's my email address. That's my LinkedIn profile. Um, I'm gonna be in the chat anyway. This event's running for a couple of days. I'm gonna be there for the, for the fullness of it. So yeah, please get in touch with me and I'd love to follow up with you after the event in some more detail. But in the meantime, thanks very much for listening. And- There's yeah, some questions. Just don't go yet. I think uh, there are two questions. We still have a few minutes. Great. All righty. Then let's start with the question from Marcus. The content gap is the biggest challenge. Does inactive work on content alliances consortium approach to develop industry standard trainings? <laughs> Graham needed a some time out to think. <laughs> we don't run away from questions. I didn't like, I didn't like the question. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, sorry, the question was about industry alliances. So could you just repeat that quickly? Yes, so the content gap is the biggest challenge. Does inactive work on content alliances consortium approach for develop, yeah. to, to develop industry standards training? Yes, totally, um, totally, totally. We're we're doing a couple of things. Actually, um, one of the things I'm going to be doing is setting up a, a partner program with Interactive. So it's really companies we can work consistently closely with. Um, also, something on a, a slightly smaller scale, working with, um, I guess you'd call it industry experts as well. So really trying to make sure knowledge is shared. Um, something we generally don't see enough of at the moment is um is just the, the basic rules of how something is done so a good example in the pc world mouse click means something but in the vr world there's quite a lot of ways of pressing a button is it a trigger is it a thumb pad is it a finger touch it's a very it's something that is going to hopefully homogenize a bit and become more standardized but I think these are all questions we need to address and we need to give our thoughts and opinion and standardize on there. So yes, um, in short, 100% and partnerships, please yeah, get in touch with me actually and we can talk further. Cool. Um, Michael Spies from SAP, who will be talking tomorrow as well, has a question for you. Is it a good idea to sell own VR assets slash scenes to other companies who have the same need? Um, if you have a team who can create create those assets actually efficiently, it's potentially a very good business model. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's a demand for them, and it's the 
uh, I'll go back to my favorite topic, the health and safety training. How many hard hats does somebody need to design? Um, a hard hat is a hard hat the world over. It's, it's just so if it's a case of assets that are very standardized, reproducible, um, it's a very logical thing to do because it, otherwise, if you think of it another way, just the the industry is trying to grow up and needs to mature. And um, it, if it's wasting so much time of people just to reproduce the same stuff again and again and again, it's it's preventing some of that. Mm -hmm. And Christine has a question. Do you feel there is a communication gap between IT slash developers and managers slash subject matter experts? Uh, if so, how to address them? Yeah, this is this is actually a very, very um, interesting topic in, in the stakeholders generally, um, because when we say stakeholders, we usually think, OK, it's the person who signs off the project at the end and gives the budget mm -hmm. go. And to a to an ex large extent, it is. But the other stakeholders within that process are crucial. So IT processes and protocols to get sort of um, security requirements sorted out. But other, even there, other stakeholders are crucial as well. So um, we're talking about training the, the trainers in all of this. For them, VR is it's a great thing. It gives great benefits. But actually, only once you know it. Otherwise, it, otherwise it disrupts their lives totally. It's putting them at risk, theoretically, because they're thinking, oh, hold on, my job here is not secure. So engaging people like that from day one in the project and showing why it'll make their life better is also crucial. So you need to think about all the various touch points you've got in the business, so be that trainers, be that IT, purchasing departments as well. Um, it's in the in the kind of the R and D phase. Companies often have ways around buying a headset or two and sourcing some development, but not not for scaling. Actually, you need to work on standard procedures and purchasing which is sometimes especially in larger organizations quite um a demanding process so yes 100 percent. okay so we have still time for a last question do you think there is a misunderstanding between 360 content and and real vr um <laughs> It's interesting you're asking me that in 2020. If you'd have asked me in 2015, um, when I was very sort of involved in launching the Vive, I would have I would have kind of argued about this because the differentiation was the, the ability to move. Um, sometimes that's that can be overkill. Um, so 360 does have a place, but and this is a big but in here. Um, just by and large 360 allows you to observe it doesn't allow you to interact um, and the ability to interact with your environment so the actual doing rather than the observing is what can take training to the next level so um i think for the people in the know um for the people who are sort of building out training modules etc they get it um probably for the wider community and the wider public there's probably a, a misperception what VR is. Um, it's it's something they may have tried once on a cardboard. It's something they may have tried on a friend's a friend's Oculus, um, and it can be any of those things. So yes, but possibly not with the important people. And uh, over time, it's also fair to say we're seeing more and more um, CGI-based VR, less and less 360. Okay. I think we have all the questions covered, but just in case, Graham, if you can stay in the chat and answer questions that are sometimes coming a little bit later. Um, so Graham will stay in the chat. Yeah. Don't worry, guys. All uh, questions will be answered. All right. Graham, thank you very much. We will see more of you thank in the you. coming days. Tomorrow, also more in the co-host uh, role. I'm really happy to have you. Um, all right, then let's move on with our next panel.